This video is brought to you by Xavi's new Star Trek merch line. Now halfway through season 1 of Picard, and things are getting even more interesting. I know a few have been complaining about the slow pace of the show, but I personally can't agree. Although the show is completely serialized, it's clearly adhering to a specific story structure rather than the chapter by chapter style of other shows. This isn't a television novel so much as it's a television movie. While there have only been short bursts of action thus far, most plot threads and character developments hint at a massive payoff in what will effectively be the story's third act. The focus has been on character progression and establishing solid relationships, which will no doubt be upended in future episodes. I'm glad Seven of Nine's presence wasn't just a glorified cameo for the sake of fan service. Instead, this is essentially her episode, and Jerry Ryan continues to prove what a fantastic actress she is. While Seven has clearly grown out of her more robotic mannerisms, there's still a lot of small affectations which Ryan has retained, such as her posture, vocabulary, and that little nod were all trademarks of Seven during Voyage. But while her blunt and unemotional tone on Voyager often held back a great deal of trauma, now this has been substituted with a deadly apathy, and the trauma this veneer holds back cuts even deeper. Poor Echeb. This opening was fucking brutal. I've seen a lot of people also complain about the graphic violence of this episode. While I don't strictly have a problem with Star Trek being violent, the Borg have always had a sense of body horror, I feel like this content did clash with other parts of the episode. The performances from both Ryan and Casey King, who took over the role of Echeb, were simply heartbreaking. But the heavily dark tone and brutal nature of this part of the galaxy is shaken somewhat by what we see later on in the episode. But first, a word from this video's sponsor. This video is brought to you by a new Star Trek merch line now available at Zavi.com. A slew of brand new, very cool designs to satiate your Star Trek itch. I myself really like this Section 31-esque jumper, which I was kindly gifted with. It's got a really nice embroidered design, one of many really cool designs in this range, and is pretty cosy for these winter months. Click the link below and use the promo code BATTLE20 for 20% off the Star Trek range or the code BATTLE10 for 10% off the site-wide items. Thank you once again to Zappy for sponsoring this video, and now back to Star Trek Picard. Returning to the present day, the dynamic between the crew of the Serena is still awesome, as each character settles into their roles. Rios and his gang of holograms is great, and Santiago Carrera must have had a blast playing so many different personalities. But while Rafi and Rios make up the cynics of the crew, Jurati, Elnor and Picard himself balance them out nicely. Picard maintains the optimism, while also having the experience, Elnor, being from an environment of total honesty, dropped into a shady den of criminals and thieves, gets some nice laughs from the audience considering how out of depth he is. However, it's this humour which brings the episode down a bit for me. Picard putting on a delightfully over-the-top French accent was absolutely hilarious. However, it's such a massive contrast to the dark opening of the episode as well as the content of the story in general. As I said, this is really Seven's episode. Once again, it would have been so easy to make her just this untouchable badass in command of her own ship etc etc, but the writers didn't make it easy. Instead, this is a story about trauma and hatred and the struggle of regaining humanity. The impact of such themes is lessened though because of the presence of such overt comedy. It's a lot of fun to see the crew dress up in silly outfits and try to pull some kind of con, but that fun comes crashing into a a wall when we return to Seven and her vendetta against Bejazel. Nakara Zadagan is a scene stealer in the role, and her interplay with Seven is brilliantly written. But when this relationship jumps to the forefront of the episode, it feels a bit like tonal whiplash. Ultimately, the drama is successful in its goals, though. I really liked the moment between Seven and Picard discussing their experiences as freed Borg. Both of them have been through so much in their past and more recently. This mutual respect for what each other have been through, but disagreement in their methods, is a dynamic I'd love to see developed more in the future. Obviously, it would be terrific to see Seven return later in the season, but if not, there's so much potential for rich material between these two characters. Then again, they are, like, my favourite Star Trek characters ever, so maybe I'm being biased. The big shock ending, though, was of course between Jurati and Bruce Maddox. While I would have liked to have seen Brian Brophy return to the role, the same goes for Manu and Tarami as Icheb, I understand filmmaking is a logistical nightmare and not everyone's schedules work out. That being said, John Ailes did a solid job as Maddox. What makes Dr. Jurati's betrayal so shocking, however, is that she hasn't been brainwashed. Ever since her encounter with Commodore O, I've always suspected something like this happening, but rather than a sleeper agent situation, this was Jurati acting on her own accord, feeling compelled to do so by whatever knowledge was imparted to 
to her by Commodore. Oh, once again, I've seen people float the notion of a Borg origin story as the big revelation coming, but I really hope that's not the case. I've made my opinion on Borg origin stories clear in the past. Basically, the only really good one is in the Star Trek Destiny novels. However, I'm confident the writers of Picard aren't going for that. As I've pointed out many times, the temptations to give in to shallow fan service have been avoided, and I don't see the writers giving in to that temptation for the big reveal. Hopefully, things come to a head in Soji's storyline in the next episode. Overall, I don't think this episode sucked, but its tonal inconsistency did hurt the larger drama going on. However, the unfolding plot keeps me hooked, and I can't wait for the payoff. Sith Slayer 91 asks, what is your favourite Stargate series and why? I answered this question in my Stargate review videos, so I'll just reiterate what I said there. My favourite Stargate show is Stargate Atlantis. I enjoyed it a lot more as an ensemble show, as opposed to SG-1 often favouring O'Neill as the central hero. I also preferred the long-running story arcs of Atlantis. Because SG-1 went on for so long, it feels like they had three series finales before the Ori even showed up. But because Atlantis only went for five seasons, the Wraith never got as dull or tiresome as the Gold became. At least in my opinion. Thanks for watching. If you like my videos, be sure to subscribe and hit the bell icon to stay up to date on all my new uploads. Over on my Patreon, you can see videos early. Speaking of which, I'd like to quickly thank all of my patrons who are now appearing on screen. Have a good one, and as always, live long and prosper.